Good evening and welcome to the HVVO PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged. You can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Just click on Q&A, scroll to the bottom, type your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. I will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where appropriate to do so. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Mo Khan, CEO. Good evening, Mo. Good evening, uh, Paul. Uh, thanks for the uh, introduction. So good evening, everyone, wherever you may be, and welcome to HVVO's first half of 2023 uh, trading update. Uh, I'm sure you've been eagerly looking forward to this presentation, as uh, have I. Uh, we've had a, a wonderful six-month period, so we'll get into the details on the numbers and, and what's happening in the background to give you a better update of what we've been up to in the last six months and also what we intend to do in the next six months and beyond. So first of all, some uh, uh, admin to get out of the way. This is the, uh, the standard disclaimer for the presentation. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Yamin Mo Khan. I'm the CEO of HVivo. I've been with the company as CEO since February of last year. Prior to that, I've had over 25 years in the clinical research industry. I have uh, with me today our CFO, Stephen. Stephen, would you mind uh, saying a couple of words about yourself? <clears throat> yeah, hello everyone. Good evening. Um, I'm Stephen Pinkerton. I've been the CFO. I was appointed in October last year. Um, and I've been with the business for about seven years. And prior to that, I worked um, in the financial industry um, with Thomson Reuters and um, Chartered Accountants. So. Thank you, Stephen. So let's get straight into... Uh, uh, this first half. So as you know, HVivo, well, for those of you who don't know, HVivo is the world uh, leading provider in human challenge trials. We are the number one, uh, in fact, the only challenge trial dedicated CRO in the world. Our mission is to effectively deliver today's healthcare by empowering uh, tomorrow's innovation. I firmly believe that the human challenge trial concept is an underutilized concept when it comes to developing vaccines and antivirals. And I think over the last you know, 18 months or so, we have seen a significant uptake in the human challenge trials from a number of our pharmaceutical and biotech customers. And a lot of these customers are now also seeing benefits, be there through getting additional incentives from the regulatory authorities, such as the FDA, or uh, biotechs who are selling their assets or the company being acquired uh, because of the results uh, from human challenge trials. So for us, human challenge trials, we believe is a, is a key way to expedite the drug developments for the right type of types of vaccines and uh, antivirals that work against infections uh, that cause a, a acute, uh, short-term, stable, measurable disease. And that's what we focus on. Uh, and going straight into the numbers for uh, the first half, we delivered a revenue of 27.3 million pounds in the first half of 2023. This is a 52% increase uh, year on year. I do want to clarify something here. We have decided to report our uh, revenue excluding other income. Historically, we have reported revenue including our other income, but the other income, which uh, consists mostly of R&D tax credit, does not really provide a true reflection of our operational ability to increase uh, the revenue we generate. So for increased transparency and being in line with the common industry practices, we feel that now is the right time to report revenue so you have a better idea about how we are uh, performing as a company so we will be excluding other income going forward. So like for like, we have a 52% year-on-year -year increase. I'm also pleased to inform you that we will be expecting to report uh, an EBITDA margin of, of around 19%. Again, this is a, a significant increase from the first half of last year. And to cap it all, we have uh, proven to be a, an extremely good uh, cash generative business. So we're showing increases in revenue improvements in uh, EBITDA margins. And we have, at the end of June of this year, a 31.3 million pounds uh, in cash. And this is after, of course, paying the one of uh, three million pound dividend, uh, which was uh, shared out uh, in uh, early June. 
With regards to our operational capabilities, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, we've conducted over 70 human challenge trials. And just to give you a little bit of context, our next competitor, we believe, has less, has less than five challenge trials under their belt. We've also inoculated over 4,000 healthy volunteers. And patient recruitment is really a key obstacle in conducting challenge trials. And we have put in place some really good uh, people and good systems to improve our patient recruitment. And this is something I will be touching upon later on. To this extent, we've also increased our lead generation. So FluCamp is our marketing platform that we use to recruit healthy volunteers to, to the different uh, media channels. And we recruited around, uh, we had leads of around 74,000 individuals in the first half of this year. We have, of course, uh, as you may have seen from the recent press releases, introduced two new challenge models that we're developing. So HMPV, human metanema virus, and also the flu B type of influenza are two of the contracts we have announced this year. So we are developing these challenge agents uh, to be utilized in human challenge trials, hopefully in the future. We are also adding new revenue streams. I had spoken to some of you about this already, but one of the um, key new steps is that we have signed a contract this year with a phase one unit to repurpose the healthy volunteers who are not eligible to take part in our human challenge trials. So this is something we are looking to add on to. And of course, there are additional revenue streams that we, are, we continue to look at and continue to explore. And for the first time, uh, really, in the, in the history of the company, we've been able to increase uh, business in the Asia-Pac region. So we signed two contracts in 2023 with customers uh, based in the Asia-Pac region. And this is something that I wanted to uh, get into, into this space for a while. And, and this success is, is really good. And also shows that you know, we are not just uh, working with the US and the European clients anymore. We, you, we do have a, a more global appeal. With regards to the order book, which personally for me, I see one of the key numbers, especially when you look at uh, forward looking and, and potential future revenues, we will recognize with 78 million pounds uh, is the current value of our weighted order book. And remember, it's weighted based on different opportunities. So, so whether a client has already completed a phase one, or whether they have some funding issues, or whether there may be other obstacles uh, preventing us from actually recognizing the full revenue. And that 78 million pounds is a, a fourth or maybe even a fifth year-on-year -year growth, uh, or say period by period we've seen uh, in the last two, two and a half years. The annual target, uh, we are reiterating at 53 million pounds. On top of that, of course, there's an additional 2 million pounds of other income. And then for the EBITDA, we expect to realize mid to high teens, more towards the high teens and mid teens. Uh, but of course, we will continue to update you guys as we go on and we will be providing a full trading update in uh, September uh, of this year. I will now move to Stephen. Evening. Um, all right, let's take it off there. Um, so Mo's already sort of touched on the um, strong growth for H1. It is a great start to the year, um, and hopefully that will continue into the second half. Um, the key drivers for this is that um, in delivering our revenue is having a strong order book, which you know, we had 76 million at the beginning of the year, and certainly for the first half, fairly fully contracted and we're fully contracted for the full year. But you do need to start off with that strong order book in the beginning of the year. Um, the other aspect is that um, we're running multiple studies concurrently. Um, and so in, in the unit um, in H1, we had five studies um, of different um, variants. And so that allows you to make sure that the, you, know, you have enough volunteers to put into the unit. Um, so that also helps um, drive a, a strong performance um, year on year. The study size has also increased. Um, it's now around about just over 100 volunteers, and that helps also continuity. So wherever you get, you know, an IND might, you know, at least or, uh, the IND might not um, materialize on time, or IMP might not materialize on time on the study, you still have another study which you can accelerate and push through into the unit. So that helps, again, um, having bigger study sizes to have a, a strong continuity of, of work going through. 
The other aspect is, as Mo's highlighted, we signed two full service contracts, but we're still delivering on a couple of, um, you know, full service contracts that we had last year. Um, and those continued being delivered into H, um, in H1 2023. Um, and this gives us two sort of additional streams of revenue. So the manufacturing stream of revenue grew quite a lot in H2 22 last year, um, and it continues to grow um, in, this, in this year. Um, so that's adding to you know, the revenue growth year on year. Um, I think what I'm very pleased to highlight is that we have invested in, in the beginning of the year, we, we made a conscious effort to uh, drive performance in, in life sciences. Um, and we've invested in the new BD. We put some lead generation in there. Um, and we've got a lot more activity happening around this business. And I think Mo will touch on that a little later on. But we're delivering 20%. This business has grown 20% year on year. And that is a fantastic result. And we're very pleased with that. EBITDA, as Mo has mentioned, um, has grown from 12.7% to 19%. Um, and in absolute value terms, uh, EBITDA has more, or less, more than doubled versus H1 2022. Um, the higher margin has really come down to better utilization. And I've just hinted in the uh, when we talked about revenue is just having multiple variant studies in the unit, which we had five. And that allows you to have more volunteers in the unit because you can recruit more easily. And so you get your cohorts nice and full in the unit. Um, and therefore, you have much better utilization in the quarantine and staff. And that not only do we deliver more for our clients, but we get much better utilization from our team. Um, having a strong order book at the beginning of the year is always helps because you have consistency, consistency of volume of work. And so you can plan operationally much better and you can start getting the efficiencies that you're looking for. Um, so we're also investing in quality improvement. So we, it's a combination of good, strong performance last year. So... Really, you know, in conclusion, you know, the rate of the business profits is increasing. Strong cash, uh, yeah, at the end of the year, at the end of H1 2023, we had 31.3 million. Um, this is up from last year, obviously 15.9 million this time last year, but it was also up from our December figure of 28.4 million. Um, and as Mose highlighted, this is after the 3 million dividend um, paid shareholders in June. So it's a nice, nice growth in our cash um, from December and from compared to last year. The company remains debt free. Um, we have a very ro robust networking capital. And some of that improvement has got to do that, you know, and then at the end of December, we did have some, um, uh, some debtors to collect and that has come down and we have collected that. But that's also got to do with very much the timing of, of the projects and the timing that deals have signed. So, you know, this is going to move around a little bit, but it is growing and is growing as expected, if not a bit higher than we expect. Um, key drivers. Well, if you, I, mean, I think we have touched on in previous presentations and things like that, you know, our order book is contracted. It comes with a booking fee. Um, and so, therefore, every time we sign a new contract, uh, we get a related booking fee. Also, the milestones on our contracts are they are set to fund the next activity. Um, and, and so, with that, so because we have that strong operational delivery and we're hitting these milestones, we get the cash up front before we have to deliver. Um, so, that allows, you know, so that's also a key driver behind the cash um, growth. And our capital spend remains very modest. Um, it's very, you know, we, we, we have a strong, strong discipline to make sure that we get a, a decent ROI on any investments that we make. And I think from that, um, I'm going to hand over back to Mo. Thank you, Stephen, for that. So as you can see from the numbers that Stephen has uh, reported, uh, we have performed excellent across all the financial uh, fundamentals. So I thought it'd be nice to give you a little bit of background on how we are achieving these numbers and why we are uh, pretty bullish about the future and how we think we can uh, hit our targets for 2023 or potentially maybe even beat them and then look into 2024 and what that holds for us. So one of the uh, goals of our team has been to diversify the portfolio of challenge agents. A challenge agent is a virus um, that we basically manufacture, we, we develop, we isolate, we manufacture, so it's ready for human clinical use. And then, of course, we need to make sure it's at the right dose. And I, I will describe that process in a little bit more detail because we are the industry leader. In fact, we are the only 
global service provider that can provide the full end-to-end -end service. And this is a, a really good um, diagram uh, of the different viruses we have currently on our books. So the green uh, viruses, the variants we have here listed, are currently um, available for use. So they're fully uh, developed models that we are currently use, using or at least marking to our, our customers. The ones in orange are the ones we're currently developing. And the two highlighted here, the HMPV and the flu B, of course, are the ones that have been awarded recently. And one of the key things to kind of take home from this is that we now only develop viruses, uh, at least new uh, viruses, new challenge models with a partner. So we look to develop these viruses uh, with a, a customer who is uh, potentially looking to do a human challenge trial. And we have been successful in this and as uh, Stephen mentioned, we have conducted five um, full programs in, in the human challenge development. And we will continue to grow this. And as I mentioned in my last presentation, we have potential new opportunities in viruses such as the norovirus and Zika and pneumococcal. And of course, we will take full um, benefits of the opportunity if it arises. We This is flexible. We will uh, move and change depending on the market demands. Uh, currently, we don't have a dengue model ready now, but this is something we will be looking to develop if we do get a partner signed up. So what is this unique uh, process that we have? So first uh, step in the whole process is really to get uh, a viral isolate. So this is where basically we take a swab sample from an individual who has an infection, and we take that and we purify it, we sequence it, um, and then we basically... Uh, put it into what's called a, a GMP facility, a good manufacturing practice facility to grow it to a certain titer so that it can be used uh, on, for human use on, on multiple human uses because we want to have a sufficient amount to be able to run multiple trials. Excuse me. And highlighted below over the last three years, uh, we have developed actually a really good revenue stream just in actually manufacturing the viruses. And this is part of our end-to-end -end service provision. The second step in this process is to characterize the, the virus. We do this by running effectively a mini challenge trial without an actual drug. So what we do is we take typically 20 to 20, uh, 30 healthy volunteers and we give them a exposure to a certain dose of the virus and then we see whether we get sufficient number of them uh, to become infected. If you have uh, a too lower uh, fraction of the individual becoming infected, we then step it up and increase the dose and then repeat uh, that process until we have around 60 70 percent of the individuals infected. Then we know we have the optimal dose uh, to be able to cause infection within a certain uh, patient population. What you don't want to do is, of course, is give too high a dose of a virus where everyone becomes infected. And the challenge with that is the viral, lo viral load in the nasal passage of the individual is so high that even an effective vaccine or antiviral will not be able to overcome this. And we are the world leader. In fact, we are the only company that has done this multiple times in, in manufacturing these viruses to GMP uh, level and then being able to characterize it so it can be used in a human challenge trial model. And of course, the, the final step is to conduct the human challenge trial in itself. This is where we select a, a number of healthy volunteers. The sample, uh, the number of healthy volunteers within each trial does vary, but we've seen an increase in the number of uh, healthy volunteers per trial, which effectively means that we've seen an increase in the value of the projects uh, we conduct. The value of the project is directly related to the number of healthy volunteers we are asked to inoculate. And what we do is we complete the placebo and the active group to see whether the vaccine or the antiviral works. And one of the key reasons why we've seen an increase in the sample size these days is that our clients now are not just looking at whether the drug works or not. They also want to determine, for example, at what dose does the drug work? Well, so previously we would have two arms, a placebo and an active arm. Now we have a, a placebo arm, 
a dose level one and a dose level two. So all this means is the client is better able to design the phase three program, get the right dose for the phase three, and also choose the right endpoints to give their phase three the best chance to show a fixie. On the bottom right here, you can see a list of recent awards that we've had over the last a uh, couple of years with regards to this full end-to-end. -end. Now, this is not to say that we expect these to continue at the current rate, because at some point we will have a, a sufficient body of challenge models that we can use. In, in those cases, we won't have to do the development process. So we won't have to do the manufacturing. We won't have to do the acquisition. We can actually go straight into the challenge trial. So for example, the next client to sign up uh, for a HMPV trial, well, we won't have to do the manufacturing or the, or the characterization because we would already have a well-developed challenge model. We will go straight into doing a challenge trial. This, of course, saves time and money for the customer, but also it gives us an additional arsenal in the army to be able to continue to fight these viruses, be, be they with vi vaccines or antivirals. So a brief overview or uh, background on the couple of the new models that we are uh, developing right now. So influenza B is a, is a type of inf influenza. In fact, there are four uh, different types uh, of influenza, A, B, C, and D. Uh, influenza A is, of course, the, the major uh, subtype. It's uh, the most uh, prevalent. Uh, when you get influenza, the likelihood that is that you would have uh, an influenza uh, A virus. But influenza B is also... Um, uh, highly prevalent, uh, or much more than C or D. So around 25% of uh, uh, people infected are infected with influenza B. But the biggest challenge with influenza B is the proportion of the people infected with inf influenza B within an uh, influenza epidemic is very volatile, which makes it very difficult to conduct a, a phase three or a phase two field trial, because you don't know whether you will get a sufficient sample of patients who are infected with the influenza B virus. This, of course, makes the human challenge model the ideal tool to determine whether your drug is efficacious against the flu B variant. Because we, are, of course, can isolate the flu B virus and inoculate our individuals with that particular virus. So we don't have the complication of not knowing whether a certain person who has influenza or flu-like symptoms is infected with A or B, because we know what we inoculated with, with in the first place. And currently, there are no vaccines available for flu B. In fact, a couple of the uh, large pharma have recently shown uh, failures in the phase three uh, point with regards to showing efficacy against flu B. So this is potentially a good market for us. We already, of course, have a, a client lined up to conduct a human challenge trial if the manufacturing and the characterization is successful, but we're also getting a good level of interest from additional uh, biopharma companies who are interested in conducting flu B challenge trials. HMPV, this is a human metanemovirus, is from the same family as uh, RSV. Again, it's not as prevalent as RSV, but it has a, a sufficient uh, amount of prevalence that it is causing uh, an issue. Uh, I remember one of the doctors called this the most important virus that no one has heard of. Um, and there is, uh, in, in some cases, a uh, high incidence uh, year on year. So this is something we need to be worried about. So we are looking at the numbers where 5 to 16% of children infected uh, with HMPV do develop uh, severe symptoms. And you can see that the number of deaths worldwide of children under 5 uh, attributed, attributed to HMPV is over 16,000 and on top of that, there's no current uh, vaccine or antiviral available for HMP. One of the key reasons why we continue to develop these new uh, virus models is that as we move forward and as vaccine technology develops, you will end up seeing bivalent, trivalent, or quadvalent vaccines. This is where one vaccine works, works against multiple viruses. And of course, if we have an RSV challenge model, and also a HMPV uh, challenge model, then that's a really good space for a company to come in and see whether their vaccine is affected against one or both viruses. 
So I mentioned earlier flu cam. So patient recruitment or healthy volunteer recruitment is the number one challenge for most uh, clinical uh, research organizations. So anyone who looks to do uh, clinical trials knows that uh, the patient recruitment uh, delays around 80% of the clinical trials that are starting. We have invested uh, significantly over the last 18 months or so in, in, in the staff and the team who are responsible for uh, the patient uh, recruitment and the healthy volunteer recruitment. As I've mentioned before, we have brought the, the call center in-house. We have hired a new management team. We have implemented a new CRM and built new algorithms in gaining and retaining um, healthy volunteers. So you can see our database is over a quarter of a million uh, healthy volunteers. We have 100% success rate in recruiting all of our uh, studies and we continue to improve and uh, become better at converting the leads into visit ones, into visit twos and into inoculated patients going into quarantine. And as you can see already, the number of calls we have made from a call center it's very significant. So this is a, a big machine, and it's one of the key reasons why we have been so successful. I'm aware of one uh, phase one uh, CRO that happened to, to be running uh, a few human challenge trials, uh, but because of recruitment issues, they've had to close down. So this really is something that we know we we are really good at. Of course, we, we, we will not become complacent. We're always looking at new ways to improve. But the multi-channels we use, so we use TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and so on, as well as attending uh, student freshers uh, affairs and other local events to kind of highlight the, the flu camp name. Uh, and not so long ago, uh, a guy called Tom Scott, who's a, a YouTube influencer with over 6 million subscribers, uh, gave a tour of our facilities. So if you haven't seen that, that may be a good way to introduce uh, yourself to hate vivo and its uh, quarantine facilities uh, and that post has uh, to date has around one and a half million views so, so again a really good platform to promote uh, flu camp and our name out there and on top of that i was I already mentioned we've now been able to strike a deal with a, a phase one unit so the majority of the healthy volunteers we screen do not actually qualify to to go into a challenge trial the screening process is very stringent with regards to health uh, and so on. But on top of that, of course, you have to be zero suitable. So you can't have antibodies against the virus we are testing. So for this reason, we have a struck a deal with the phase one CRO, whereby the healthy volunteers that we screen are ineligible to go into our human challenge trials, can be repurposed and put into phase one trials that the phase one CRO is running. So, of course, the number of human challenge trials we are running at the moment continues to go up. So, as this graph shows, we've seen a, a successive increase in the number of trials. So, this basically means, of course, that we have more revenue. Uh, it's also due to the diversification of the human challenge models we have. And, of course, the fact that we can deliver more healthy volunteers uh, in, a, in a time frame. And this is something I expect to continue to increase. So, not only are we delivering for today, but we're, we're also building for the future. Some of the investment we have made with regards to technology is not just to address today's needs, but also improve the deliverability of uh, 24 and 25 numbers and so on. The number of healthy volunteers required in each trial is also increasing. I mentioned why that case is. But as we move forward, as our clients tend to see bigger benefits from the trial data they're producing from human challenge trials, then I, I think we will see even bigger trials. And of course, we continue to work with the regulators, the nonprofit organizations to promote the utility of human challenge trials and the human challenge trial data to expedite vaccine and antiviral development. A couple of case studies, so we recently completed a uh, human challenge trial for Sedara. They use that data to uh, partner with, with Janssen, which was announced uh, in, a, in a press release not so long ago. In addition, uh, the first, oh, one of the first RS3 vaccine uh, hit the market or approved gut marketing authorization uh, in May of this year. Uh, this was Pfizer. We, of course, ran 
the human challenge trial for Pfizer. And as a result of that challenge trial, or at least as a contributing factor of the challenge trial data, Pfizer were able to get fast track designation, thereby expediting the regulatory review of the product and saving up to two years in the regulatory uh, timelines. As this RSV vaccine has come to market, we, we see this as a, as a great sign that a, a drug that has been studied in a human challenge trial setting is now ready to go into patients. And because of the challenge trial, of course, it's getting to patients much faster. And for this, this for us, this is a, a hugely successful story. And we want to repeat this again and again. And as a result of this, we have seen an increase, an even more increase in human challenge trials. So people see the results of the human challenge trial data and what they can do. Whereas before we used to say it can do this, it can do that. Now we can say it has done this. So the benefits of human challenge trials are now tangible. I wanted to give you an idea of the diversification of the, the, the pipeline. So the pipeline uh, refers to the sales opportunities that our sales team is currently managing and handling. This is not contracted work, this is potential future work. Of course, not all of this will be signed, not all of this will happen. Some clients will decide not to do the human challenge trial, some will have no funding, some maybe will postpone it about three to five years, or some will go ahead. But the key reason I am highlighting this on a slide for you is to show the, the diversification of our client base. So by geographic region, you can see we now have a client base across North America, Europe, and uh, APAC. With regards to the type of company, we now work with both pharma and the biotech. But the most important pie chart really is at the bottom, and the multicolors you can see in that shows you that we now have interest in multiple challenge trials. Whereas historically, we maybe only have one or two challenge models that were really contributing significantly to our revenue and our order book. Now we have a much more variety. Of course, each time we knew we had a new challenge model, we open up a, a new revenue stream. And this is important for us as we plan to continue to grow as fast as we think we are going to grow. This chart is from Global Data, which is a, a database for uh, clinical trial analytics. And what I wanted to show you here was that the continued increase in the number of phase one, phase two clinical trials that are being initiated in the indications where we have a human challenge model. I'm not saying that all of these trials are eligible to be uh, converted into a human challenge trial, but this is the type of market we have that we wean from to conduct human challenge trials. And as you can see, this continues to increase year on year. And I have intentionally not included COVID in this because, of course, COVID peaks and it is too high of a, of a factor to be able to show what is the real underlying trend in this increase in the number of trials being conducted by different companies. We will continue to add new revenue streams uh, to our portfolio. So one of the items we are working very hard on is increasing our H-Lab services. So we're now actively marketing and selling our lab services to third parties to conduct non-human challenge trial work. And this is something that's currently ongoing. As I mentioned to you before, we have signed a contract to provide a, a clinical site services for a phase two or phase three trial. The volunteer repurposing I have already mentioned and something that's currently active. In addition to that, we have successfully, as of towards the end of last year, started consulting services, especially in quality assurance and also in clinical development. And this is in addition to the consulting services that Ben Life Sciences provides. Ben Life Sciences, of course, most of you, you know, is a subsidiary with offices in uh, Breda in the Netherlands and also Paris in France. We have added a, a new office in uh, Leiden uh, in the northern uh, Netherlands uh, in the Leiden Biotech. And that's a great location for us to be in considering the huge biotech opportunity available in that biotech park. I'm pleased to say that Ven Life Sciences is now coming uh, in its own with a 20% growth uh, in revenue in, uh, year on year. 
and we have invested in um, in sales and marketing uh, resources there as well to let it begin to realize its potential. Of course, it continues to uh, cater for the human challenge trial that HV works. So the the medical writing or the protocol development is conducted by Ben Breder and the the end part of a challenge trial, the biometrics, which includes data management biostats, is conducted by our colleagues in Paris. And we, as you can see from the chart here, we are uh, marketing the clinical uh, development services that Ven has, and we're now also adding new consulting services to their portfolio of services. As we see changes in the market and new services being offered, such as the advanced uh, therapy of medicinal products, this is gene therapy and cell therapy, and we are beginning to see good amount of interest coming into those regions. Stephen, back to you. Yeah, so um, I, th I think it's very nice to see that our, our revenue, uh, our, our contracted order book of 78 million um, is up from our December figure of 76 million. And this is after delivering 27.3 million of revenue in the first half. So we're more than replenishing our contracted order book. I think that's, you know, so it's really gives you a sort of a sense uh, of, of potential growth in this business. Um, I think the, 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 some of the highlights in that order book is the, you know, we have signed two full service contract wins in flu B and HMPV. And because these are new models, this will in self perpetuate more volume of work in future years. Um, but, you know, and it also comes in back of the fact that we signed all four last year, so at least three last year. So a total of five full service contracts, um, some of it is still being delivered at, as we speak. So it's, it's, it's in great shape. Um, the other aspect is that the order book now also includes um, two Asia-Pac biotech challenge wins that we won during the year. Um, and that just shows you the, uh, you, know, that, you know, the effort that we're starting to put in the BD. Um, is, there's opportunity in Asia-Pac, and so that's growing nicely. I think we're very also pleased to see that a, a global pharma consulting contract of $3 million win for Ben Services. Um, and that shows, you know, that reflects that, you know, Ben is growing. It's grown 20% um, for, for H1. Um, so that, that is a very nice result. So it's, it, that 78 million means we're fully contracted for the um, full year, for the rest of this year. And it was also giving us a very good visibility into 2024. Um, so we, you know, despite, well, we've had a very good um, half year, H1, 27.3 million, and we're holding to our guidance at this stage for 53 million for the full year. Um, Want to make, make note that we are fully contracted to deliver that 53 million. And as I've just mentioned, we have very good visibility with our order book into 2024. EBITDA margin remains, our uh, EBITDA margin uh, remains, uh, target remains uh, mid to high teens. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a very good, we are in a very good position to deliver this guidance. And when September, when we announce our interim results, our full interim results, will provide a, a further update on 2023 and should be able to give you some ex a, a view on 2024. So I'm going to hand back to Mo, who, who will wrap up. Thanks, Stephen. So hopefully you've been uh, uh, hopefully impressed by the trading update. Uh, we, we, we think we have uh, delivered uh, good uh, on our numbers uh, and we will continue to uh, uh, look to do better as we go forward. Uh, the investment case, um, I believe, remains strong. Uh, the fundamentals across the board are, are very strong. Uh, I'm not going to go through each one again. But one of the things we are looking at is to continue to improve our efficiencies and continue to improve our margins. We have the world-leading capabilities. I don't think anyone can argue uh, against us on that. We are the only human challenge trial dedicated CRO in the world. We've got the team that has unique experience and expertise in manufacturing viruses and characterizing viruses and also conducting um, human challenge trials. In fact, the only company in the world that has created bespoke challenge models uh, multiple times. The market continues to expand. As we look to add new challenge models, there's some new opportunities out there for us. We're looking to add new revenue streams, um, which work hand in hand with the facilities and the resources we have. So although they're not going to be huge in regards to total revenue, they should 
give us high margins because we will, we, we will look to uh, conduct those services without adding too many resources and within the same facilities we, we currently work in. And we're also targeting new biotechs. You know, we've added two new biotech companies already this year. And of course, new uh, region uh, in APAC for, for new clients. The hurdle to entry remains very high. So uh, I do expect at some point we will have competition, um, but it's, it's going to take somebody with very deep pockets to try and compete with us. But of course, the experience we have uh, is impossible to compete against. And that's something that money cannot buy and something we we really utilize significantly uh, when we are marketing our services and, and, and trying to close new business. The outlook going forward, you know, 53 million pounds in um uh, in revenue, we, 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 we reaffirm that. Uh, and as depending on what the MHRA does, you know, we ho look to hopefully beat that. Um, the mid to, teen, uh, mid to high teens EBITDA, um, again, um, very uh, confident in hitting those numbers. But I think if you want to take one message home is look at the order book. I think that's a key message uh, because the order book, um, tells you that now, even though we are burning revenue, we're generating revenue, 27.3 million of it in the first half of this year, we are actually winning more work than what we're actually doing. So the healthy 78 million weighted order book um, that gives us full 100% um, revenue visibility for the rest of this year, but in fact, well into the second half of uh, next year. And we will continue to aggressively market and sell our services to the biopharma industry, not only the human challenge drugs, but the band life sciences services, as well as the additional um, revenue streams I talked about. So I thank you for your attention. Uh, I hope you are uh, are happy with the with the trading update as I am. Uh, I congratulate the team on uh, on doing a, a wonderful job, and we are highly motivated in making sure that we hit or beat our numbers for the full year. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, Mo Stephen. Thanks for updating in the presentation. Um, ladies and gentlemen, do please continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab just situated on the right-hand corner of the screen. Just while the team take a few moments to review those questions submitted today, I'd like to remind you of the recording of the presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, we're able to be accessed via your investor dashboard. Also, just like to remind the attendees today that due to the number of attendees on today's call, the company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives. However, we'll review all questions submitted today and we publish responses where appropriate to do so on the Investor Week company platform. Um, Mo Stephen, as you can see, we've had a number of questions both pre-submitted and throughout today's live presentation. So if perhaps Mo, I could hand back to you um, and just uh, start at the top, read out those questions where appropriate to do so and I'll pick up from you at the end, please. No, well, thank you for that, Paul. And uh, I, I can tell you right now, there's no way we will be able to uh, go through all of these questions. We've got a, a large number of pre-submitted and also new questions that have come through uh, during the presentation, but I will go through them as fast as I can so that uh, I, I, I try and get to as many questions as I can. Um, so is the current bank balance in line with expectations for this point of the year, or is it leading or lagging it? Stephen, you want to take that one? Uh, I, I think the, the, the current balance is uh, it's a little bit better than we expected. It is growing, which is always very nice. And um, so I, it really reflects the growing order book and a, a strong delivery. So it should continue to grow. It will move around a bit because our figures are, can be a bit lumpy in terms of when we sign the contracts or when the milestones are hit. But generally, I would expect a, a consistent growth rate in that cash. Thank you. Okay, uh, what do you see as the biggest driver of growth in HVO revenue in H2, 23 and beyond? Well, the bigger driver, of course, is uh, human challenge trials, right? So as we continue to add new challenge models, uh, it opens up new opportunities. We will continue to see increase in the revenue that the Van Life Sciences deliver, but the human challenge trial still will make up the majority of the revenue for the second half of this year. On top of that, of course, uh, we will be doing some manufacturing, so the HMPV, for example, uh, and, and some of the flu B work that continues to happen at the moment. Mo, you and Katal are experienced men and presumably having regular meetings with investors, correct? When would you expect institutional investors to recognize HVV's potential and finally trust what is happening here in West? So in fact, uh, Stephen and I uh, have met um, a number of uh, institutions over the last uh, nine, 10 months or so. Um, and we are seeing an increased interest from institutions. In fact, 
some of them have uh, come on board onto the shareholder register. Not as many as I would like uh, personally, uh, but I think one of the key things that we can do is to continue to deliver on our uh, expectations. And then I, I believe it's only a matter of time that the institutions will come on board and the share price start to reflect the va true value of our company. Any contact from the UK government re future collaboration on COVID? No, a simple one. When will the latest model for COVID-19 be given approval for running challenge studies? So we have a, a, an Omicron variant of the COVID-19 uh, already uh, manufactured. Uh, we are currently uh, looking for a partner uh, to help to characterize this and to uh, conduct the challenge trial. And that's something we are currently actively, actively pursuing uh, on a number of uh, fronts. So I'm hoping that in uh, uh, 2024, we will have um, a good level of activity when it comes to COVID. And the reason why I'm, I'm more confident maybe than I have been previously is because the next generation of COVID vaccines will be mucosal vaccines, which we either inhaled or uh, tablets. And they prevent you from getting infection uh, and potentially prevent transmission. And I think that generation of vaccine would be an ideal fit for a human challenge trial model. Um, has the company approached HVivo expressing an interest in takeover? No, we've not had any formal uh, approaches yet. Is NASDAQ listing possible in the future as FDA approval of our work with Big Pharma? I don't think the FDA approval is linked to a NASDAQ listing. Um, I know I don't have any current plans to be NASDAQ list, uh, listed. Our clinical trials are conducted to the internationally uh, accepted ICA GCP uh, guidelines, uh, which are accepted by the FDA too. So independent of where you conduct those trials, the data is accepted by the FDA and four of our clients have been given fast track designation uh, through data conducted in uh, our UK based human challenge trial unit. With the general improvement in landscape and acceptance of human challenge studies by regulators, how has the company benefit from, uh, benefited from this? Well, as you can see, the, the increase in the number of the human challenge trials that we're conducting, the increase in the project size of the human challenge trials we're conducting is as a result of uh, the uh, increase of responsiveness from the regulators. So, uh, it, has, it has happened more than once, in fact, where a client has come to us that they want us to do for them what we had done previously for a client who has got fast track designation. So that is currently happening. Uh, are the company able to harness this change in outlook by regulators to expand more rapidly? That's, I mean, 100% something we are looking to build on. We know we are, we are in the sweet spot here and we need to make most of that. So. Not only are we working with the regulators, non-profit organizations to increase the profile of our human challenge trials, but we are, of course are working together with the clients and meeting with the regulators in optimizing the design of the challenge trial that would be best suited for the regulators and benefit the client in getting expedited uh, drug development timelines. In February, I asked a question about the release of RNS for contract wins and Mo mentioned they were in discussion with a broker to, to determine the threshold required. Can you share this is information as to what value is required for the contract when to be RNS as so an investor are better informed? So yes, we have, uh, I mean, I have weekly uh, conversations with our Nomad broker um, and we have, dis we discuss um, each contract uh, that is awarded to us. And uh, according to uh, the guidelines from uh, AIM, we of course, uh, have to announce any contract that has a, a significant or material bearing on any of our financial fundamentals. So those are the key rules. And of course, our, our nomad ensures that we, we keep that. And we will continue to, of course, abide by all our uh, AIM regulations. What is the current situation with the weighted order book pipeline? Well, 78 million pounds. Also, how much of the projected 22-24 revenue is now secured? Well, as I mentioned, um, the 2024 um, revenue, we believe it goes well into uh, second half of the year in 24. Of course, we have not given guidance for 2024. That's something we will do later on this year. So I can't give you a percent value as to how much of 2024 revenue uh, is already contracted, but uh, definitely more than 50%, let me say it that way. Um, what's your business plan regarding the data agreement that you have with Poolbag? 
when it expires, do you plan to renew it? And if so, will you continue to allow pullback to access your data? Well, pullback is our customer in the fact. So it's really up to pullback to see whether they would like to uh, uh, purchase an extension uh, to the access. So uh, this is something we will be working with them and to see whether the demand is still there. Why do we never see Kahal Friel anymore at some of the uh, company's shareholder meetings? Kahal Friel moved into a, a non-executive uh, chairman role and as a non-executive, he's not involved into the day, day and day. Uh, myself and uh, Stephen together with the executive team are uh, held responsible for the delivery of the uh, the targets that we set ourselves, and of course, uh, myself and Stephen report to the board on a regular basis, which of course, Kahal Friel is the chairman of. Uh, the pace of new business seems to have slowed down from previous years. Can you outline the reasons? Well, hopefully you, you've seen from the order book, it's not actually slowed down, it's actually speeding up. The order book is uh, the highest it's been for, for a long time that I can think of. And also, we, we, we've seen an 52% increase in year-on-year -year revenue. So even though we have uh, generated uh, much higher revenue uh, compared to the first half of last year, we've still been able to grow the order book. Would you accept that no contract for five months and little communication with shareholders for the same amount of time is not the way to drive shareholder value? If you don't agree, can you please explain? Um, so basically, uh, from my point of view, you know, we, of course, uh, value and cherish our retail shareholders. They are the backbone of the company. I mean, you are part owners of the company, uh, and I'm responsible to deliver uh, value to yourselves, and that's important to me and, and, and to the uh, rest of the executive team. Uh, and the board uh, represents every shareholder we have in the company. Um, but the, the continued increase in the size of the project uh, has resulted in, in continued growth. And I don't see that uh, reducing. We will be doing more uh, shareholder facing events. So for example, we will be doing an IMC in September. And we also, uh, we presented in April, and we will be presenting, uh, or uh, we are registered for a webinar during the Master uh, Investor Healthcare um, in, in September. So we will be um, increasing, um, uh, uh, basically we will be giving, or I will be more FaceTime. So hopefully that, that's good. Uh, what steps have you taken planning to improve your ratings on websites like Glassdoor? Uh, what percentage of your clinical lab employees are permanent staff? So around 80% of our uh, clinical lab employees are permanent. Um, uh, Glassdoor is, uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't give Glassdoor as a true reflection of the status of what the employees think of the company. I think the people who do register their feedback um, on Glassdoor tend to have a grudge against the company. Uh, but just to give you an indication of our employees, so we, we've... Uh, started, initiated a company-wide bonus scheme, an incentive plan, increased our training program. We've actually improved our retention rate significantly. So we're keeping a lot more of the staff uh, than we ever had. So I, 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 I believe, I know they're happy. Otherwise, why would they continue to be with us? And I think everyone is excited with the continued growth you've seen. I mean, who doesn't want to be working in a growth company um, in a, a working clinical trials at, at a cutting edge? Um, have you determined any methodology to extrapolate vaccine efficacy for lower respiratory tract infection? Um, so this is something we are looking at, but you have to also remember that um, there we don't have many volunteers getting lower tract respiratory infection because we are working with healthy volunteers. Um, but we are looking to see um, how we can increase the measurement of lower uh, tract respiratory infection to improve the correlation with uh, field-based trials. What is the future pipeline look like? I think I've hopefully answered that question already. Okay, coming to um, the, the the questions from today, what is the limiting factor that is causing delay, delays at the MHRA and is it fixable? So it's the resource constraint uh, within the MHRA that has been a bottleneck in the review of uh, new protocols and uh, protocol amendments. Uh, we have been working very closely with the MHRA uh, as well as our customers to put together uh, plans to expedite the responses. But we had a risk mitigation policy in place, uh, and that's one of the reasons why we are able to reiterate our, our full year guidance. Um, uh, is it fixable? 
I wish I could fix it myself. Of course, it's a government uh, entity, a regulator, um, and uh, as much as we can work with them, we are working with them. Uh, but we have seen signals of improvement uh, very recently. So we have seen uh, approvals starting to come through now. So I'm hoping that the, the major impact uh, is already over. Uh, maybe uh, this is one for you, Stephen. How is Ben contributing to HGVO, uh, considering HGVO was a merger of the two companies to start with? Um, so Venn Life Sciences provide two services. Um, they, they do all the medical writing, um, the synopsis design, and all the CSR report for our challenge study. So as you can imagine, if our studies challenge revenue is growing and is a key driver in the growth of this business, they are also having a, a stronger impact in delivering that. And as Mo mentioned in the back engine, at the end of the study, um, all our, you know, uh, provided it's, it's not dealing with big pharma, all our contracts um, use our biostats our biometric team um, in France, um, who do all our data management and by stats um, statistical analysis. So they, they, they're very involved, um, and we have a regular weekly meeting with them to update how the challenge business is moving because they have to contribute to it. Thank you very much. Uh, what plans do you have for your increase in cash bar? And well done for everyone's hard work. Well, thank you for uh, the well done. Um, we do have plans for uh, the cash. Um, so. Uh, Watch this space, uh, really. Uh, let's see what happens uh, as we move forward. Can you start, uh, this is one for you, Stephen. Uh, can you start reporting cash split between available cash and cash held in the form of customer advance payment? I ask this from the viewpoint of customer advance payments being non-refundable. Uh, yes, you, we can do that. It's actually quite easy to calculate off the balance sheet. So when we publish the balance sheet, you can literally take um, trade debtors less deferred revenue, and that gives you the sense of the cash that we received up front on our clients. Okay, uh, great to see the cash position. Um, uh, Stephen, this is one for you again. What interest rate are you currently receiving on this, please? Uh, we do have quite a bit of cash invested, obviously, on deposit of, uh, stages between 30 days, 60 days, and 90 days. We do also invest across a couple of institutions, well, actually three institutions, um, to make sure that it wouldn't, uh, you don't want to have the iceberg Iceland effect again. Um, so, but I suppose in short, the answer is close to banker's rate and banker's rate, and it's, it's, it's flexible. So every time the banker's rate moves, um, Bank of England rate moves, it also increases at the same time. It's ju it's just under that banker's rate. So it's quite close. It's good. How is the mix for the order book developing, e.g. larger or longer individual contracts? So yes, uh, we are actually winning larger uh, contracts as you, you would have seen from the RNSs we re released this year. Has the order book has your order book value increased as a result of yesterday 13.1 million contracts? So someone's being very astute there. So yes, it has increased, but not by 13.1 because some of the work has already been recognized. Uh, so, uh, and of course, as we continue to generate revenue, uh, it, it, eats in, it eats into the order book. And then of course, we need to generate new sales to continue to supplement that. Um, are currency movements likely to be a factor in the result this year? No, because we don't really have any foreign currency contracts. Do you expect EBITDA margin to continue to increase or plateau? I expect to increase and then eventually plateau. But where it plateaus, well, that's something uh, uh, to look forward to, but continue to increase, uh, I think, is the, the key take-home message there. Are you considering paying another dividend at year-end results? No uh, commitment right now, but of course, all options are open. We'll see what the, uh, the management team and the board decides at the, at the right time. Um, can you explain in detail your revenue recognition policy? Maybe not too much detail, Stephen, but maybe an overview. Right. Um, so we, in simple terms, we recognize revenue based on delivery. Our uh, project uh, contracts are very detailed by a line item, and, um, and to the extent that that line item is delivered, whether it's an hour or whether it's a unit or whether it's a visit or whether it's a day in the unit, um, there's a charge that goes on to the client study and revenue is recognized accordingly. So it's very much revenue is recognized on delivery. Okay. Um, uh, if you're not going to use your cash on hand for acquisition, would it be of interest for a company to institute the share buyback, maybe a quarterly Dutch auction to support the share price during low liquidity periods? So at the moment, um, I think the key message really is that we, we are very pleased with the cash that we're generating. Um, the fact that we are generating cash, I think, is a, is a very, uh, well, 
uh, it's, a, it's a good plus, let's say. Um, and we will uh, be looking at that together with the board and determine the future path of the company. So, so all uh, options are currently on the table. What is the guidance? Why is the guidance so conservative for 2023 given the pipeline of work? Um, one of the reasons really is the, the, the MHRA. So we, we just want to make sure that uh, we are a little conservative uh, because we are relying on the third parties like the MHRA to give its approval uh, to be able to start a clinical trial. Um, and that's one of the uh, main drivers. Mo, Stephen, um, I know you've rattled through a lot of questions there. And thanks for, for picking out so many from investors. I'm sure they're very grateful. We are just coming up to the hour mark. Um, and of course, all those questions that have been submitted, the company will be able to review any further questions that come in. And we'll publish responses on the investment company platform where appropriate to do so. Um, so perhaps at that mark, um, Mo, I could just ask you just for a few closing comments before we redirect the investors to give you some feedback. So thank you, Paul. Uh, so I, first of all, I apologize for uh, maybe talking too fast uh, during those uh, Q&A, but I wanted to get through as many of your questions as possible. Uh, but as we will be increasing our interaction with our shareholders, uh, I'm sure you will be given ample opportunity to ask your questions again if you haven't been able to get a, a, an answer that you're, you're happy with today. So happy to uh, do that uh, given the right opportunity. I hope you feel uh, as optimistic as I do with regards to um, the company's uh, future, the the fact that we have now uh, consecutively uh, hit our um, financial uh, targets, I think is, is really a plus. Um, I'm also very proud of the, the group of people that we now have employed at uh, HVVO uh, and its subsidiaries. Um, they're a very strong team, uh, all in the right uh, positions. Um, the fact that retention is is the best it's at, it's at been for a long while. Um, means that we've been we're able to create a really good culture uh, within the company. Um, I've had received so many comments from external visitors as to how motivated uh, and happy um, the teams are that are working for, for us. And of course, you have to remember what we do is cutting edge. Um, nobody else does what we do as well as we do it. So it's not like something that's routine. Um, we are developing uh, viruses and challenge models that have never been developed before and conducting trials that are basically first in class. So uh, thank you for your time. I uh, hope you found this uh, useful. Uh, but as ever, I'm here uh, at your service. And if you have any further questions, uh, I look forward to uh, answering those. Uh, in the meantime, uh, thank you for your time. And thank you for attending this call. Thank you. Hi, Stephen. Thanks indeed for updating investors and, and taking so many questions. Could I please ask investors not to close the session to be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order the team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete and I know it's greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of HVVO PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good evening to you all.